Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Derek Alexander. I'm Head of Archaeological Services for the National Trust for Scotland. Um, and what I want to speak to you today about is our recent work at Glencoe. Um, the National Trust for Scotland over the last few years uh, has undertaken a, a number of projects uh, around the sort of period of the Jacobite Risings. And of course, we have a number of properties that relate to this period in Scottish history. Uh, most famous of all, of course, are, are the battles. So from the, the first rising, uh, the Battle of Killycrankie, the Battle of Dunkeld, uh, Glencoe is the end of the first uh, rising, the Battle of Glen Shield from 1719. And of course, probably most famously, uh, the raising of the standard at Glenfinnan uh, for the 45, and then it's, uh, the final battle at uh, Culloden in 1746. Uh, of course, the, the history behind the Jacobite uh, uprisings are well known at, at this point in time. It stems from uh, results of the Glorious Revolution in 1688, when uh, King William of Orange lands in England and James uh, uh, Seventh and Second flees uh, to France and in the following year, William and Mary are proclaimed joint sovereigns, first in England and then in Scotland. And of course, people who were against them and supported the Stuart dynasty and James uh, became known as Jacobites uh, and from the term, uh, the Latin term Jacobus for, for James. Um, the trust, this isn't the, the trust has had quite a long term interest in the history of this sort of period. In fact, here's a little publication by Bruce Lenman, a professor of history at uh, in, through in Glasgow, um, who produced this little publication back in the 1980s in association with the Trust, uh, which looked at uh, the period, but also highlighted some of the Trust properties that had um, specific reference to the period. So uh, the battlefields are, are, are mentioned, and of course, some of the main built properties, so some of the places like Fivey Castle, Castle Fraser, Crathis, House of Dunn, Hill of Tarbot, these sort of places um, get a mention early on in this in this publication. But today uh, we're going to look at uh, Glencoe uh, and of course best known probably or infamous for the massacre of the 13th of February in 1692. I'm not going to go into the history of it in a lot of detail because it's pretty well known. It's one of those subjects that you sort of get told about at school and it, it features in lots of traditional tales. Um, but it largely results uh, from at the end of the first uh, Jacobite uprising uh, and after battles in Scotland, Killicranky, Dunkeld, Cromdale, uh, and its victories in Ireland, uh, King William is really looking to sue for some form of peace, uh, largely because he wants troops that are holding down uh, positions of garrisons in the Highlands and elsewhere in Scotland uh, that he can then take and redeploy to the continent where he's still engaged in, in wars uh, across Europe. Um, so what he wants is the, is the clans or the troublesome clans largely to go away. Um, and uh, to do this, he wants them to come into his peace. So he sets a date for them to sign an oath of allegiance to him by January the 1st, 1692. And he hopes that that will then mean that they can, he can withdraw uh, numbers of troops from the, from the area. Of course, um, there's a delay uh, in the, the Campbells, the Campbells, the McDonald's of Glencoe signing uh, the Oath of Allegiance. Uh, McKeon, the head um, uh, chief of the clan of McDonald's, tries to get to, he first of all goes to Fort William to sign, but then gets sent down to Inverary, where he gets four or five days late, uh, and his signature is eventually taken by the sheriff there and, and passed on or, or not, as the case may be. Um, but generally, the, the government is at the time uh, in Scotland and in England uh, used it as an excuse to um, make an example of one of the clans, and they chose the McDonald's of Glencoe because they were troublesome, uh, but they were also a, quite a small clan, and also they could be boxed in in their in their glen in the Highland uh, um, terrain uh, and could be uh, um, destroyed. And the fact that the order is 
extirpated root and branch. Um, and of course, the, the documentary uh, evidence for that is quite well known because there was a, 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 um, a, an investigation into it uh, after the event a few years following. Uh, and of course, it goes, the, the, the documents of the order for the massacre uh, are preserved in the National Library of Scotland and, and various other places. Um, it's of course known and because of the, um, the, the Argyle troops that turned on their hosts uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the evening of the, and morning of the, the 13th of February 1692. And of course it goes down in song and uh, art here. And this is James Hamilton's 18, uh, 80s painting of Glencoe, which is held in Kelm Grove, Grove Art Galleries and Museum uh, in Glasgow, Glasgow Life and through in Glasgow. And of course, every year the, the, the anniversary of the massacre is marked on uh, 13th of February uh, with a small parade and church um, uh, um, service and the church parade running up from here to the, um, the monument. Um, and there's uh, various members of MacDonald clans uh, and affiliated clans uh, to turn up at that every year. Uh, as I say, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the, the history of the massacre, um, but if you're interested in that, I, I point you in the direction of the National Trust for Scotland's uh, uh, podcast on the subject, which is um, uh, Jackie Bird is the host of it, uh, and Scott McCombie, who's the senior ranger at Glencoe, goes through the major traditions, and I'm there to throw in a couple of bits about the archaeology, which is what we're largely looking at today. Of course, if you've not read it, I also point you in the direction of John Preble's uh, 1966 fantastic book on uh, Glencoe. Um, it gets a bit of a, a panning sometimes from historians because he doesn't uh, really use referencing and he's not a historian as such. So it's quite readable in that sense. Um, uh, probably one of the still one of the best accounts, although at the end he does produce uh, some of the documentary evidence and some of the sources that he looked into. Uh, of course, what it does is it quite neatly goes through the entire uh, history and the, the on the left hand side here you can see the chain of command that goes all the way from the orders signed uh, by King William himself at the top. Uh, and encouraged to do so by Sir John Dalrymple, the Master of Stair, who was keen also to make an example of the McDonald's in Glencoe. Uh, and it, that was passed down through the military commanders in Scotland to uh, Colonel John Hill, uh, who was um, the local officer commander in Verlochy, Fort William. Uh, and really then to the commanders on the ground who were in charge of the troops, Lieutenant Colonel James Hamilton and Major Robert Duncanson, and of course, the man who was in the Glen with the two companies of Argyll Militia, Captain uh, Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, we know that MacDonald was, uh, McKeon, uh, Alistair MacDonald Glencoe was late. Uh, and when the troops received their orders, having stayed with uh, the MacDonalds for uh, the previous 12 days, um, they turned on their hosts uh, and uh, murdered around about 38 uh, individuals, mostly women and children, some men, uh, but out of a population probably 400 to 500, largely a lot of them got away. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, McKeon himself was one of the first casualties. And that's all recounted and, and well known in the, um, in the documentary history. This is the map of Glencoe in Preble's book. Um, and here I've marked on the, the settlements, the townships throughout the Glen, um, starting from down at Loch Leven here and heading um, uh, eastwards up uh, to as far as Achtrichten, which is the site that we'll be looking at. And the 120 troops were divided, uh, billeted amongst uh, the townships uh, in, in the, uh, throughout the Glen uh, on the morning of the, the massacre itself. Uh, and they were going to be reinforced by probably another 500 or so more troops to coming down from Fort William uh, the night before. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton with about 400 men went to Kinloch Leven and was heading over the Devil's Staircase. And Major Duncanson 
uh, headed towards Balahulish to cross at the ferry there with probably another 120 couple of companies again. So it was quite a large number of, uh, of troops that were involved in the entire operation. And the idea was that they would cut off either end of the glen and have the men in the middle of the glen um, and there would be no escape. Uh, at five o'clock in the morning, um, Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon uh, starts the massacre uh, by killing uh, um, McKeon at Carnock in this area here. Uh, and his troops are ordered to turn on uh, the rest of the McDonald's throughout the townships at the same time. Major Duncanson is delayed though, and he doesn't get there till seven o'clock. Uh, so a warning is given. Uh, and Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton, delayed by snows over the Devil Staircase, doesn't arrive until in the top end of the glen until 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, so the routes to the east and to the south were unblocked and large numbers of the population of Glencoe were able to escape. And that's a sort of overview of, uh, of Glencoe. But what about the what about the archaeological evidence? What where are the settlements in Glencoe? Well, this is Roy's map of the 17, 17, late seventeen forties and the seventeen fifties, um, which shows uh, Loch Leven here at the top, the Glen, Loch Treichten in the middle, uh, some of the woods, uh, the couple of the rivers and the burns, and in red marked dots here are the settlement, the township sites, um, and I've marked them here in red dots so you can see them a bit clearer. And I've put in there where they are now. Invercoe is where the current village of Glencoe is. And in brackets here, I've put in roughly, based on the numbers of houses shown on the map, um, out of a population of about 500, how many people would have lived in there. So Invercoe, uh, either side of the river, maybe about 110 people. Larif, about 60. Carnock, probably about another 60. Inverriggan, 60. Like in Tiam, maybe about 80 people there. Achnacon, the Field of the Dogs, uh, about 70. And highest up the Glen, Achtreichten, about 80 people. Um, and the settlements or townships at Inverriggan, Achnacon, and Achtreichten fall into the area uh, of the Trust, National Trust for Scotland's ownership in Glencoe. Uh, and one of the things we were keen to look at was to see whether there was any archaeological evidence left for, for the township sites. Uh, and today we're going to look at Achtreichten. And here's, if you know Glencoe at all, the big lochen in the middle, the big dramatic uh, lochen gets lots of photographs taken and features and lots of adverts um, is, is well known. Uh, and here marked on Roy's map is uh, an old roadway, probably just a track. It's not the military road at this point. Um, the military road is still going over uh, the glen, uh, over uh, the Devil's Staircase. But here at Achtreichten, as is mentioned, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight buildings shown on this map. And the main thing to note here is they're on the north side of the road. And when you look, go um, so that's in the 1750s, so maybe 60 years after the massacre. Um, but when you look at the mid 19th century map, the first edition Ordnance Survey map, here is pretty much the line of uh, the track, which is now turned into a, a, a major roadway. Um, there are two farms uh, to the south who are ma marked as ruins on this map in the 1870s. Um, and these are the sheep farms of the mid 19th century, already ruinous. But what's clear here is that there's nothing to the north of the road at this bend as shown on Roy's map. So this was the area we were keen to look at. The current road built in through the Glen in the 1930s now cuts off this loop and comes through between these two townships or these two farms, sorry. Uh, and if you're driving through the Glen, they're marked quite clearly by the trees in the middle of the Glen. So we went out and had a look and here's the trees and the 19th century uh, farm, uh, a sheep farm. And here's the road running through and curving around. That's the bend in the road there. And lo and behold, on the north side of the road at this point, there is a turf structure um, about uh, 12, 13 metres long by about six metres wide externally. 
and you can just see it's not the best archaeology and it's not the most upstanding and clearly defined um, so marked out here with these yellow flags uh, but there are were a number of structures and enclosures in this area that mark the outlines of the township so we surveyed it and here's the modern map with again with the two farms the sheep farms on it the current road running through the middle here uh, and then the old road as marked on uh, the first edition map and on Roy's map running through here and on the north side quite clearly you can see we found the remains of one two three four five structures about four enclosures and uh, a, a grain drying kiln as well and we look at those in a bit more detail closer in here uh, on the steep slopes above there's this very steep sloped enclosure with some rig inside of it in fact if you were ploughing your field and tripped over you'd probably roll out the bottom of it it's picked out nicely in raking sunlight but otherwise it's quite difficult to see on the ground uh, on the north side of the road here uh, there's a couple of structures here um, parallel to the the line of the glen itself and i think those are probably houses and there's a couple of perpendicular up and down the slope that may well be barns or byres uh, with the wind coming through them across uh, and running up and down uh, the the um, the contour lines and here's a number of enclosures again with the rig around them and the kiln a little trackways running between the enclosures and the kiln upwind away from the um, the structures and the thatched roofs so we decided um, that we have been done the, the plan of the site what we'd quite like to do is focus on excavating a, a number of trial trenches in this area here um, and we went out back in 2018 with a small team of volunteers on a, one of our trust national trust for scotland working holidays uh, and we wandered out along the road we park at the lay-by layer and here you can see one of the great things about working in Glencoe is the difference in uh, in conditions no matter whether it's rainy or cloudy or sunny it's always spectacular so a great place to work and um, the only downside is that this is an incredibly very busy road and really very very noisy um, so early in the morning is nicest uh, and but during the day it does get quite quite loud so here is walking out the old road to the site and this gives you maybe a better indication of, of where we are in the glen uh, Loch Treachton is just off uh, the screen to the right here um, the current road in the middle the old road running through here with the farm on the south side of it and then all the humps and bumps uh, and on to the north and in fact just behind this big erratic boulder uh, is is another house structure here and another one down here so this is the area of the township of Achtreachten. Um, now, while it's marked on the 18th century map, that's 60 years after uh, the, um, the massacre, we also know that Achtreachten was uh, occupied as a township in the 18th century. Uh, and it, there are various documents that relate to the people who stayed there. Um, we know that John MacDonald of Achtreachten on the night of the massacre he was visiting his brother down at Achnacon uh, and he's there in the morning when the troops turn on them uh, and he and his servant so John MacDonald of Achtreachten are killed uh, at Achnacon and um, we don't know if that many people were killed at Achtreachten itself there's re references in to Preble in Preble uh, about an old man possibly one of the old poets uh, being killed there but it seems that the majority of the of the township inhabitants managed to escape probably um to the east before um a uh, colonel hamilton gets over with his troops but we also know that people were the mcdonald's were still here in the as i say in the 18th century and we know from the records of the muster roll of the jacobite troops for 45 that um, the McDonald's of Glencoe managed to send a company of around about 100 men uh, uh, on the on the campaign, uh, and they're all listed, uh, or not all of them are listed, but some of them are listed and named, including uh, uh, about nine McDonald's from Achtreachten and one a McStalker also from the township. Angus McDonald, the the the, the head man of the township. Um, we know in fact was killed at the battle of preston pans in 1745 uh, in the first charge uh, there 
Uh, and some of the other members of this uh, of the McDonald's who are mentioned in the in the muster rolls are are named at the time uh, and also given occupations. One of them is uh, is possibly a, a keeper of the change house, which is a, an inn. So maybe one of these buildings beside the roadway here could have been an inn. Another one is a, a shepherd. Another one is a drover. Another one is a merchant. So it's nice to have these documentary links. But the archaeology, we uh, we managed to um, undertake quite a bit of excavation work. So we we uh, opened up trial trenches on House One and in the enclosure of uh, Two here, along in front of uh, House Two, uh, and then we did some test pitting in between and some metal detecting uh, in the in the enclosures in between, not not in the houses themselves. And quite quickly, we came down upon uh, uh, stone foundations for the houses. And here you can see uh, some of the paving and in the interior of structure one uh, and a uh, quern stone built into the paving there. Quite a nice quern stone near the central central hole and really quite shallow underneath the surface. Uh, largely, I think, because the site has been quite heavily robbed. Uh, probably robbed of stone and, and other uh, materials for uh, the sheep farms uh, in the 19th century, but also for uh, the up gradual upgrading of the road over the years. I think stone and other materials were probably removed from the site to build into that. So in um, 2018, we undertook these trial trenches. Here we are uh, recording the sites and it gives another view looking up the glen gives you an idea of where things are. Our metal detecting uh, produced some nice results initially. So we've got a, a coin here, possibly of Charles II. We're unclear. It's very heavily corroded, so difficult um, to tell. Uh, unfortunately, it would be, ni be nice to get a, an ident a definite identification, but I think it's just too far, far gone. Um, but we also got some nice pieces of um, ceramic and pottery. This is a piece of um, rim from a tankard, a manganese mottled ware, which is a, quite a fine ware. Um, and, and it just makes me think that this may well be uh, a sort of tankard um, that you would have got at a roadside inn, which can, sort of confirms the, the um, change house interpretation of one of the, the names of the McDonald's of Achtrichten. Um, these date roughly from the 17th, mid 17th century through to the mid 18th century. So um, sometimes they're stamped with the current king's name on them. But unfortunately, we didn't find that bit. It must be there somewhere. So we'd like to go back and, and do some more. Uh, other types of pottery, we've got, we've got uh, 18th century and um, uh, 17th century material. Again, trailed slipware, unfortunately, has quite a long a chronological span, but is typical of the sort of period. Uh, we returned to the site uh, um, the following year uh, and to focus on the full structure one uh, and to complete uh, an entire plan, or excavated plan of one of the buildings. Uh, and we went back again with uh, volunteers on a thistle camp, and here they are clearing the site and excavating down um, the entire area ground plan. And uh, we were able to recover a complete uh, ground plan of the structure. Um, only in a couple of places were the internal wall faces uh, still surviving, one at this end here and one uh, on the, uh, the inner side of the wall here uh, at the, um, the, the east end. Uh, but a lot of paving survived uh, and a low mound of wall and possibly stone, large boulder forming the basal course there. But most of the wall had been had been robbed away. And what we've got in the paving is possible drain lines coming out the, the doorway here, a, a, another second drain coming through here. And here's the, the um, quern stone built into the paving at the bottom. And this marks all the individual finds. And we're working through that um, at the moment. Uh, here's the site as it was um, being excavated. So you get an indication of the, um, the extent of it, the back wall here, front wall, um, some of the paving running through the mound on, of disturbed mound of the wall uh, and 
this gives you an indication of where it is again in relation to the road and Ach uh, uh, sorry, Loch uh, um, uh, in the background there looking down to Ach Nikon, where um, uh, on the night of the massacre, um, MacDonald of Ach was killed. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of feud in there. Of course, it's it's always on the on the wet, nasty days that you take these sort of photos. On. I should have taken one. And of course, the BBC turned up for an interview when it was pouring with rain. We did have nice days, but yeah, they always seem to turn up when it looks really nasty. Uh, in terms of other artifacts, we found um, uh, some nice metalwork. This is the uh, an iron lock, probably from uh, a wooden dresser that would have stood within the house. Uh, at uh, uh, um and we've had it looked at uh, and I don't know whether you can make out in the x-ray here is the key plate for it uh, and when we showed it to the lock expert he said oh, it's still locked. <laughs> uh, other artifacts um, we've got lots of glassware uh, lots of broken glass more pottery uh, the trailed slipware that I was talking about some sort of pearlware um, window glass and quite a few little glass beads as well. So a nice range of domestic material. Uh, this is us doing our, uh, before we had our drone, uh, using our, uh, our kite cam, uh, which is always uh, quite fun to get the volunteers and make sure they hang on to it and there's no low flying jets. Um, and it produced this very nice aerial shot of the site, which again clearly shows the outline of the the wall and here it is in situ uh, the paving and the drainage channels coming through another one coming through here uh, and the, the amount of material that was removed from the excavation so quite a nice overview of the site uh, and we hope to go back and do more uh, one of the problems with the site i think was it's the type of archaeology it's quite ephemeral it's quite um it's not the it doesn't jump out at you and shout he, i'm a house you really have to walk over the site and get your eye in to understand it and um, so it wasn't a site we felt that we could interpret very easily for the public and it's also quite difficult to stop at the uh, beside the road there there is a layby but it's a bit of a walk in so what we thought we would do was take the evidence that we had from the archaeological excavations uh, and uh, build a replica on, of, uh, based on the ground plan that we recovered from Achtreichten uh, down at the visitor centre, the current visitor centre, uh, which is further down the glen, actually cl closer to Inverigan, between Inverigan and Achnacon townships. Um, but if you know the glen, you'll know where I am. It's well, well signposted and it has a very nice cafe. And we got Tom Morton, the architect, who works a lot with uh, earth building. Um, and he uh, uh, produced a design for the upper portions of the site, obviously a crook frame, uh, because we didn't have much in the way of evidence uh, above the ground level surviving uh, on the excavated site. Um, so there's a certain amount of conjecture involved there. Um, one end possibly being uh, given over to do domestic activities. Here's a little dress and one possibly being a, a buyer uh, at certain times of year. This was drawn up and went for planning permission uh, and uh, we got all that through okay. I was meant to be getting built this year or last year, but COVID prevented that unfortunately. Uh, but we've started construction work now and in January we uh, excavated out uh, the, the area foundations and uh, we collected stone and turf uh, and the uh, craftspeople who are involved um, who are experts in wattle work and turf building and stone dry stone walling and in timber construction are moving on a pace with the construction work and I was up just a couple of weeks ago uh, in much better weather uh, and you can see the crook frame is now up. The stone foundation was went down first and the turf wall is starting to be built uh, around the, um, the wicker frame uh, on the inside. So hopefully in due course and about the end of this year, you'd be able to visit a replica of the site that we excavated at Achtreichten. And hopefully that will give people an indication and interpretation of what it was like, what the types of structures that we uh, expect to have been 
uh, in Glencoe in the end of the 17th century at the time of the massacre and certainly in the 18th century um, at the time of Roy's maps what it would have been like. Um, so thank you very much for listening I just want to say that this work was supported through our um, Hogs of Heather appeal which was to do with gathering material for the roofs of the uh, replica and also from by the National Trust for Scotland uh, Foundation USA and of course from all trusts members thank you very much for listening.